Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, your go-to source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We hope you tune in often for all things people management, organizational development and change, organizational leadership, and social impact related. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Marcy Westcott about the importance of mindfulness and implementing mindfulness in the workplace. Marcy Westcott, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thank you, John. I'm really excited to have the chance to talk with you uh, and explore the topic of mindfulness and how it relates both to us you know, personally at home and in our families, but also in the workplace and how we can improve a company's mindfulness culture. So that'll, that'll be the real focus of our discussion today. As we get started, I want to share um, your bio with the listeners. Um, founder okay. of the Still State Meditation and Mindfulness Instruction, Marcy Westcott spent 20 years in sales and service management with American Honda Motor Company. There, she experienced firsthand how stress and anxiety in the workplace affects both the well being of people and a business's bottom line. Over the last 15 years as an entrepreneur, Marcy has served in leadership positions on boards of nonprofits and civic organizations. She is certified as a meditation and mindfulness instructor through the McLean Meditation Institute and has advanced certification in mindfulness work, uh, a program designed to train instructors to take mindfulness into the workplace. Marcy has been published on LinkedIn, Elephant Journal, and Thrive Global. She works with individuals, businesses, and other organizations and is dedicated to improving well-being and quality of life in the business environment. Her mission is to help businesses and organizations enhance perspective and improve culture in order to reduce workplace stress and bring awareness to the importance of employee well-being. Uh, this is really important work, um, and I great background. I'm really thrilled to have the chance to talk with you today. As we get going, um, is there anything else about yourself that you would like to add in terms of background? Well, first, thank you for uh, reading all of that. I know it's kind of <laughs> kind of a mouthful. Um, my mission really is to help end suffering in the workplace. Uh, there's just a tremendous amount of suffering going on right now. And unfortunately, you know, a microscope has been placed on that with the current situation that we find ourselves in uh, regarding the, the pandemic. But I also want to just mention that another mission that I have is to dispel Uh, the misconceptions around mindfulness work uh, and meditation, uh, because those misconceptions are many. And it's really something that prevents us from being able to experience the the multitude of benefits that those things have. Yeah, I I think so. Um, We throw around those terms a lot. And I think sometimes people don't have a real great grasp or understanding of, of what they actually mean in practice. Uh, maybe conceptually they do, but uh, in practice and, and what that can actually look like, um, we don't always get that. And particularly when it, it, we talk about bringing it into the workplace, I think there's, um, you know, we see sometimes in movies or TV shows and we see caricatures of it, um, but Absolutely. I'm not sure we always see like really successful implementation of, of some of those types of practices. So uh, I think I think this is a good opportunity to, to discuss all of that. Yeah, and if I can just add to that, uh, I think it's really helpful and beneficial to really define what mindfulness is, because as you said, um, you know, the media sometimes presents a, a little bit different uh, picture uh, of it, but mindfulness can really be defined very simply uh, by paying attention to what you're doing while you're doing it, with a non-judgmental attention. That's really, in essence, what mindfulness is. And 
when I say non-judgmental, I'm talking about without evaluating and without analyzing. Because from the time we're born, we're really trained to view the world externally. Uh, and this shows up in, you know, lots of different uh, ways, most of which are unhelpful. Um, when you aren't focused on the present moment, uh, you may be projecting about the future or ruminating about the past. But when your attention is there, it creates stress. And stress has just a, a whole variety uh, of different uh, problems and challenges that it presents to us. Uh, and those challenges don't show up anywhere more uh, prevalently than they do in the workplace. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you mentioned stress, and, and really this is a time of heightened stress, heightened anxiety, um, lots of uncertainty, um, people juggling. You know, we, we talk about work-life balance in a normal world, um, but but that's even more complicated now with so many people working from home. And, you know, if you have kids at home and they're trying to do school and you're trying to balance work, life, family, home, school, um, you know, ev all that stuff, it just, it can be incredibly difficult. And so that's, you know, the context everyone sits in. And then you, you layer on top of this pandemic context, we, we find ourselves in this, this um, broader social climate you know, where we have Black Lives Matter, we have um, the protests, we have, it's an election year, uh, and so there's a lot of political divide, we, you know, uh, there's just all the economic uncertainty, there's just all this stuff layered on top of what is already a really difficult situation with the pandemic, uh, and that's on top of what really was already a mental health crisis in the United States, um, and and it just is a really challenging time, and so you know, on the one hand, I would say, you know, anyone who may feel like they're struggling with depression, anxiety, those sorts of issues, you know, it's, that's a medical condition. Like you, you really, there shouldn't be this shame or stigma or embarrassment about it. Go, go see a doctor, go to therapy, get medication as appropriate, practice mindfulness, do these other techniques to help manage um, those, those stresses and and I would just encourage people to do that I, I think most people will benefit from um, therapy uh, at some point in their life I think most people would probably benefit um, tremendously through mindfulness practices um, just on an ongoing basis particularly in a, in a situation like this yes and it absolutely I, I'm so glad that you brought up mental health because you know that uh, there's been a, a stigma uh, around that for a very long time um, the light is really being shown on it now with the, uh, the situation that we're in uh, with the pandemic crisis and when we talk about how mindfulness can really impact all of this this is an absolutely prime time to start to implement these practices in the workplace uh, we talk about attention and mindfulness is paying attention to what you're doing. Well, our attention is being hijacked in a way that it never has been before uh, for all of the reasons that you just mentioned, uh, this, this landscape that we're in uh, with, with the pandemic crisis. And so you know, we have lots of, uh, lots of phrases that we like to use in, in mindfulness instruction about attention. But what we know and what the science shows is that our attention is powerful. What you place your attention on enlivens. Where your attention goes, energy flows. And so if we can begin to focus our attention on being more mindful in the workplace and implementing some of these strategies, the benefits are not just professional, but they're also personal. Uh, we see a back and forth, a, a kind of a, a handshake of mindfulness benefits, both professionally and personally. Uh, if you think about it, we spend a third of our life at work. And unfortunately, that third is some of the least unhappy time. 87% uh, of, of workers report that stress is their number one uh, issue uh, in the workplace. Uh, employers report that 75% of uh, of their issue is stress at work. And so all the more reason to address this now 
and start to move toward cultivating a, a culture of uh, mindfulness employee well-being. Uh, it's just, it's so important. It's never been more important than it is now. And quite honestly, you know, I believe that once we go back to uh, some semblance of a more normal, you know, type of, uh, of environment, once this is all over, we're going to appreciate even more uh, the ability to be more mindful, both personally and professionally. And we're going to be able to uh, appreciate connection more than we ever have been before. Yeah, and I, I sure hope that's the case. And I think it can be as long as we give proper attention to it now. Um, this is a really great time for organizational leaders to really be thinking about uh, how they can build in um, these types of practices uh, to, to drive greater creativity, innovation, productivity, mental health, you know, all these positive outcomes um, for individuals and, and the workplace itself. Um, this is the time that they can really be doing it because this is a time of disruption. This is a time where everything is being shaken up and, and really leaders have to question everything that they've taken for granted. You know, we, we just consider this is the way it has to be. Check, check, check all these different elements. And now all that's thrown up in the air and we realize there's probably a lot of things that we were doing that weren't necessary in the past that we just took for granted. Um, and, and inertia is a powerful thing. Uh, and and it's it's difficult to challenge the status quo, even when there's an an acknowledgement uh, of potential harms. Um, so the, so this is a, a reset opportunity. And one of the most significant ways that we can begin to experience uh, some of these benefits is with the topic of multitasking. Uh, I was just sharing some information with a colleague uh, just a little while ago uh, about multitasking. Um, you know, more and more people are coming to the realization that multitasking is not our friend and it's not good for us. We have been trained to kind of treat that as a badge of honor, and many, many people do. Um, but we're finding out just how detrimental it can be. And this is something that really is an eye-popping statistic, but not only is it not good for us, but it actually affects people around us. Uh, just recently, they came out with some uh, new statistics that multitasking actually uh, reduces your IQ by 11% and it'll, it, it reduces comprehension by 17%. And then when you add on to that, that you're actually affecting the, the people around you, you know, we say that stress is an emotional contagion. Well, multitasking is becoming a contagion also. I'm excited to announce the publication of my new book from HCI Press, The Alchemy of Truly Remarkable Leadership, Ordinary Everyday Actions That Produce Extraordinary Results. Consider how the nature of work has shifted over the past 50 years. With increased globalization, rapid technological advancement, and the shift in economic composition, the average job of today looks very different than the average job of 50 years ago. What will the jobs and organizations of tomorrow look like? Moreover, what does this all mean for organizational leaders? What are the core competencies and capabilities of organizations and their leadership that are prepared for continued disruption and geopolitical and socioeconomic shifts? Regardless of what the future holds, increasingly, leaders need to be socially minded, data-driven, decisive, champions of talent, and disruptors of the traditional notions of leadership, teams, organizations, and work. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership will help you to explore your own leadership competencies and capabilities and consider ways to apply and implement them into your workplace and personal life. Yeah, really interesting. And I'm certainly uh, as guilty of that as anyone else, I think. Um, I, you know, we, we just find ourselves, we're, we're in such a hectic, busy world, um, that we, we just are trying to get stuff done thing after thing after thing. And that's really why mindfulness is so important because it helps us to, 
to calm our mind, to just be present in the moment, give our focus to what we're dealing with right now. Um, that has implications certainly for our own productivity, but it has huge implications for our relationships. So, you know, definitely my wife would be the first to tell you, like if, if I, she will call me out, if, if we're like <laughs> in the room together, we're having a conversation, but I'm not actually there mentally, you know, I'm like thinking about something else or whatever. Like, yeah, that, that has a real impact that, that impacts how she feels valued by me that has impact for um the quality of the communication for the, the understanding that takes place or doesn't take place you know and in the workplace uh it's the same thing so if i'm a boss and i go to my employee and i see maybe they're struggling with something i'm, I'm concerned about stress anxiety or whatever or they're just not getting something or they or their you know their productivity is declined so i'm i'm now there with them i'm giving them feedback i'm having a conversation with them if i'm not truly mindful and present in the moment with them as we're having that dialogue then probably what's going to happen is that instead of them feeling supported and strengthened and empowered to learn and grow and improve they're going to feel you know rightfully so that i have some other agenda that i'm focused on the next thing they're not that that important to me and it's it's seen as a more punitive act uh, even if my intention is actually pure and I won't actually just want them to, to, to feel uh, empowered. Um, just because that's my intention doesn't mean that's what is going to happen and what people are going to feel. And one of the easiest things to do is to just get rid of the clutter and just focus um, when you're in the moment. And no nothing is more impactful than us giving attention to someone. Uh, we've all experienced that. Uh, you know how it feels when someone is actually paying attention to you. And that, uh, th that actually you know, impacts everything that we do. Going back to multitasking for a moment, you know, we multitask in ways that we don't even realize because we've become so habituated to doing certain things. Um, I was having this conversation with a group of leaders that I was uh, speaking to about a month ago. Take driving to or from work. Uh, yes, we have Bluetooth. Uh, that can be a, a great thing, but it can also be detrimental because the studies show and the science shows that when you're having a conversation while you're driving, you're actually using the same resources in your brain uh, that you would use. Um, you know, if you're looking at something, that's that's actually you know using some of those some of those resources uh, to pay attention to what you're doing. And so ultimately, what happens is when those resources become stretched then we actually may not see uh, you know, some obstacle in the road. It can actually create accidents. And there's a study that says that 47% of people spend, or they spend 47% of their day in a state of mindlessness. Mindlessness means to accidents. Accidents lead to 47%. <laughs> and some of that 47% is probably when you're driving to and from work. Yeah. Uh, you know, you're focused on something else. But, you know, this has tremendous impact for businesses just from a safety standpoint. Uh, think about if you're a utility company and you have workers out, you know, working on the utilities. If they aren't 100% focused on what they're doing, accidents happen and you know the studies show that 97 percent or 90 percent of workplace injuries are due to human error so if we're spending a good part of our day in a state of mindlessness you know what does that what does that tell us yeah wow that's that's a really startling i suppose not surprising but startling statistic um and something we should really keep in mind so then the question becomes like really how do we as a as organizational leaders how do we create more of a mindfulness culture uh within our organization where people can make it a priority um be, you know in part it's making the business case like why does this matter how is this going to help us be more successful um but beyond making the business case like what else can we do well, we can start by number one, defining what it is and understanding that and dispelling some of the misconceptions around it. Uh, if you are an organization, you know, you can bring these practices into the workplace. And what that can look like is having, uh, you know, some training that uh, focuses on discussion about 
what mindfulness is, how we implement it in the workplace. And then using experiential exercises to actually experience those things. Uh, a very, very simple one uh, that I train uh, anytime I'm talking to an organization is what we call a mindful moment. And a mindful moment is simply letting go of everything that has already happened, not focusing on what's going to happen later, but focusing on the present moment, bringing some attention to your breath, uh, closing your eyes and just being focused on where you are right now. So if we begin with that, that's just uh, an example of the many different types of uh, exercises that can be implemented. And, uh, it, you know, that's a, a mindful moment uh, is something that you can practice during transitions. So, you know, obviously you would want to close your eyes, but if you're leaving your office and you're walking to a meeting, focus on simply walking to the meeting. And it sounds idealistic and it can sound really simplistic sometimes, but we know from the science that this has tremendous impact on us. It interrupts our brain's reactivity. It interrupts the domination of compulsive thinking patterns. And so simply walking to that meeting and focusing on being relaxed as much as you can be uh, and walking to the meeting, uh, that's just an example of how you can implement it. Yeah, and it's it's rare, but I've been in organizations or I've been in meetings or in settings where leaders actually will pause and say, okay, let's take a moment. Um, and it's it's quite refreshing <laughs> when it happens. Uh, and it really only takes a moment. I mean, you, you can take a, right. minute, a minute, you know, 30 seconds. Like, it doesn't take a lot of time. Um, right. But to, just to, to quiet your mind a little bit. And, and I think, um, you know, there's lots of ways to do that. Uh, and so whether, you know, for some people it's, it's meditation or prayer or whatever, um, but it doesn't need to be that formal and it can be, you know, just walk, like you said, walking down the hall or, you know, I, I find myself really looking forward to my daily walks with my dogs for that same reason. Like it's just, I'm outside, I'm at the park, I'm walking around, there's nature, I'm with my dogs and nothing else really matters at that moment. And I mean, that's one of the best parts of my day. <laughs> yeah. Well, my dogs are a great form of therapy for me, I'll tell you. <laughs> uh, but yes, you're, you're absolutely right. And, you know, here's another thing that, you know, leaders are oftentimes very much at odds with this, but slowing down, slowing down and then paying attention has a profound impact on not only your own well-being, it impacts your productivity it impacts your efficiency. It creates uh, an opportunity to innovate. Uh, and I think that that's one of the things that I would, you know, beg of, of leaders to consider is, you know, companies are always looking for ways to innovate. Um, one of the best ways to innovate, especially right now, is to implement mindfulness into the workplace. Yeah, and something you said earlier in our discussion, that actually really stuck out to me and it's important to remember is that you know even if we feel like we're good at juggling lots of things and and uh, we're, we're you know perhaps a leader you know they've been incredibly successful in their career you know they, they've been the things they've done up to that point has got have gotten them to where they are and so they figure you know for the average person maybe multitasking doesn't work but for me i can do it <laughs> maybe that's true maybe that's not i don't know that's kind of beside the point though because what like you said ultimately what they're doing impacts everyone around them too uh and they're modeling and setting an example and there's just the very real interactive impacts of having you know a leader you know, juggling and multitasking all those things all at once and how that affects other people. So, you know, even if you think that you're really good at it and that you can do it effectively when others can't, um, you know, it's worth considering maybe you need to make a change too, uh, because that will um, affect those around you. Yeah. And, you know, employees are always looking to see, I tend to, I had someone tell me once that my employees were like my paparazzi. Um, they're always there. They're always watching you. Uh, they're always looking to see what you're going to do next, anticipating what might happen next. And so as leaders, uh, if we can lead and lead by example, 
that filters down throughout the entire organization and it really improves the culture. And the bottom line is profitability. Study after study after study shows that mindfulness uh, increases productivity and, and it implements that or it increases the bottom line, uh, particularly when we talk about health healthcare costs. You know, stress is um, the leading cause uh, of high health care costs and it manifests in a lot of different ways. Uh, what's one of the biggest costs a, a business has? It's health care. And so, you know, you can look to uh, lots of uh, companies that have been leaders uh, in this. There's a, there's a lot of them. I think Aetna is probably one of the flagship uh, companies to implement mindfulness practices and show what they can actually do. Uh, Aetna's results uh, showed that they improved um, their bottom line by $3,000 per employee per year. That's huge. And if it works for Aetna, um, it's going to work for other businesses too. Uh, Google, Facebook, Intel, Goldman Sachs, LinkedIn, you know, the, the list is long of businesses that are doing this and about 20% uh, it increases about 20% per year uh, of businesses that are beginning to, to do this because they're seeing the results. They're seeing the results in the bottom line. And ultimately that's what businesses are after. Yeah. Well, excellent. And I, I appreciate all of um, those statistics to support what you're saying too. So if anyone has any doubt or any question, you know, it really does matter. Um, this has been a really fascinating discussion. Uh, unfortunately, we're about out of time, but before we part ways, I want to make sure I give you a chance to share with the listeners how they can get connected with you, learn more about what you're doing, uh, and reach out. Sure. There's a variety of ways you can uh, connect with me. Uh, you can connect with me on LinkedIn, uh, on Facebook. Uh, my company is The Still State Meditation and Mindfulness Instruction. You can go to my website. Uh, which is the stillstatemeditation.com uh, and reach me there. And uh, I look forward to you know, being able to spread the word and help other uh, businesses and organizations implement these practices because it's so needed right now. Well said, well said. And I hope uh, that my listeners will take advantage of this opportunity, reach out to Marcy, get connected, um, Marcy, it's been a true pleasure talking with you, and I hope everyone stays healthy and safe. Have a wonderful week, and uh, be productive and happy at work. Thank you so much for having me, John. We are excited about the launch of HCI's new magazine, Human Capital Leadership. Human Capital Leadership is a free, interactive e-magazine designed to help individuals, leaders, and organizations find innovative approaches to maximize their human capital potential. We will be publishing issues quarterly in August, November, February, and May. Check out the first issue and let us know what you think. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.